I'm delighted to be here um, uh, to share with you a way that I connect with the world that's really, really important to me, has been for a long time, and, uh, and I hope that it will be fun and interesting for you to hear about as well. So we're going to do three things in the next 20 minutes. I'm going to talk about how I got started, the writing. So the skinny is that I write 106 people on a cycle uh, with calligraphy pen and, you know, that I dip in ink. Uh, I write about four letters a day, and I'll explain the different kinds of letters that I write. So that's the, the skinny. But what we're going to do is going to talk about the background. How did this get started? Uh, the second thing I'm going to do is talk about the process, because the process in itself, uh, I don't know why it's important, but it's become a part, a really important part of the way that I actually write. And then finally, I'm going to sum up by talking a little bit about, well, why? Why do I do it? Why do I take two to three hours every morning and write these letters. So, background. About a dozen years ago, uh, my older sister June uh, was dying of cancer in Missouri. And um, she's a long ways away. All the rest of the family are right near her in Missouri. I was a long way away. And once I heard that she was uh, going to pass away, in other words, that was pretty clear what was going to happen, what I began doing was writing her actually emails. So I wrote her an email, started writing it. I didn't begin with the idea that I'm going to write her every single day, but I ended up doing that. And they weren't just like, you know, hi, how are you, here's the weather. I wrote these three, four-page, single-spaced, emails about everything in the world. <laughs> and uh, I did it for almost nine months in a row. And what happened was that as I wrote the emails, her, uh, uh, her daughters, my nieces, who would go over to June's house and read the email sometime, they say, well, could you just copy us on those emails? Uh, and I said, sure, so then I had an audience of about eight, and then I, it continued, and then they told people about it, and I found myself copying four or five other people on the, these emails. So it continued like this for about, uh, for that nine months, uh, until June passed away. Now, her daughters called me about two, three days before they knew that she was going to be gone, and uh, told me that. So what I did was I did a tape recording of three of my letters and um, had it delivered overnight to June. And in her last hours, my uh, nieces put it in a tape recorder, set it beside her on the bed, and left the room and, uh, and let her listen to my letters in her you know, last hours, which was just a beautiful thing to do and was very important because it was sort of the end of the long process. And at the end of the, uh, when June passed away, at her funeral, I wrote her another letter. And I'm going to read just a couple of, a couple of sentences from it. Uh, it's a very long <laughs> letter, so I'm just going to read just a tiny bit. But it begins, um, Dear June, it seems I'm to write you yet one more letter. With these words, I lay down a report of the heart, a record that celebrates our lifelong friendship, the threads of experience with which we have woven that particular corner of our lives that we shared. And this is near the end. This is near the end. This last year has been particularly significant in our relationship, for you gave me one of the greatest gifts. You asked me for something special. All my life, I'd been pretty much on the receiving end of your generosity. Then you asked me to make a gift to you. Letters. I forget how it started exactly, but once it did, my letter writing gained momentum and finally turned into an ongoing day-by-day -day journal of my life. Experience, poetry, philosophy, stories, and whatever came up. After sending quite a few emails, I asked if you didn't want me to slow down. <laughs> and you replied... Please, oh, please don't stop your daily emails. 
If you just say good morning, I love you, it will make my day happier. And so I wrote and wrote and wrote, hardly missing a single day from September until May. And sometimes I'd get really discouraged and hate what I wrote, and we'd be just ready to give up, and then I'd get something like this note from you. Dear Charles, I just want you to know how much I enjoy your emails. Every contact I make with you brings happiness to me. Then I'd cry a while <laughs> and write one more letter. This was your final gift to me in this life, June. You gave me a reason to write, day after day after day, no matter what else was going on in my life. You helped me begin a discipline of writing that will never end, wherever it leads me. So that's how it started. And uh, so by the time, this time, by the time of June Trill, I had maybe a dozen people. And then, I don't know exactly how, yeah, I can't really remember back, but just more and more people began asking me to write them and to copy them on these emails. But for some reason, I decided to change my medium. And so I've always been fond of calligraphy, just looking at it. And I love paper. I just love paper. I love really fine paper. And, um, and so I started writing with a calligraphy pen and paper to these people. And then it just spread. <laughs> And the first thing I knew, I was writing 20 people, but now with a calligraphy pen and paper. Um, and then it grew. Like, for instance, at my, uh, sometimes at my classes at Antioch, when I would introduce myself, i talk about this. And, and they would say, oh, would you write me a letter? And so I'd say, sure. And then one of the more interesting places that I picked up people from my list was uh, I hung out for a couple of years at the Cafe Umbria a whole lot. And I always sat outside writing. <laughs> and so I'm sitting, I always sat outside. And so I'm sitting there, you know, with my beret and my, you know, and my winter coat and my scarf, and I'm out there busy writing. And people on their way out would stop by and they'd say, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'd say, oh, I'm writing a letter. Well, what kind of a letter? And so they would sit down. <laughs> and I'd tell them basically the story that I'm telling you. And they'd just say, well, would you write me a letter? <laughs> and so I'd say, sure. So I take down their address, and so I have several people I've been writing for six or seven years who I've never seen be again. Um, and so, uh, and then you meet people on airplanes and parties, and then friends have friends who like letters. And so before I knew it, I was writing 50 people, uh, and I'd written 500 letters. And I decided at that point, because I'd never kept any of them, I never copied a letter, and so I decided, I'm giving a piece of myself away every day, and so I should keep these. So I began collecting, and now I have about 4,000 that, uh, that I've kept. Um, so that's how it got started. Um, let me tell you about the process. The process is really interesting. By the way, this is, I didn't start out with the process this way. I have no idea exactly how it evolved this way. But, uh, but this, is, this is the way I do it. So I write one eight and a half by 11 letter. And I write on both sides of the paper. And the letter has to end at the bottom right hand side of the second page. I never write a third page or a sentence beyond that. So I always do that. So what I do is I have six files of ideas. Each file has about from 50 to 75 writing ideas or topics for a letter. For instance, so here's file B. So today when I go home, or sometime today, I'm going to open this up, and whatever the first topic is on that, I'm going to write the person who is the next person on the list. And uh, so I keep an ongoing list of people I write. And uh, so I go back to list and see who's next. And what I do is I choose the person, and then I, I don't look at it. And then I open the file, and that's where I'm going to write them. And then when I'm finished with that, I write three more, and I write these on cards. You know, art cards, something like this. Okay. And so the way I, my process for doing that is that I have about 40 dictionaries and dictionary encyclopedias. So what I do is I go, I select three of them ran, randomly, and I bring them out, and I set them on my desk outside. And I take the, I find the three people who are going to receive it. Here's my... Um, 
Here's the uh, place I keep the list for the people who are going to receive the cards. And there's a whole lot of people that are on both lists. And so what I do is I take uh, the dictionary and I flip it back and forth and I just stop somewhere and then I find something on that page and that's what I write the first person. And then for the second person I write, I take the second dictionary and I flip through it and open it randomly and I write them about that. And then the third person. So, so this takes me about, about two and a half hours to do. But I want to tell you, that, so why? I mean, why, why do I do this? One thing is, I guess I can sort of paraphrase W.H. Auden when he said that one of the most outstanding characteristics of poets is that they are passionately in love with language. They're just passionately in love with language, and that's what I am. And so this gives me an opportunity every single day to play with language, to try, you know, and it's so, it's so wonderful when I open up that book, I mean, that in, and I have no idea what I'm going to write about. And somehow I have like 30 seconds to find some sort of a connection between myself and my life and this physical concept, <laughs> concept of physics or something, or, or an idea, a, a, a historical happening in the Old West or something like this. And so that's very, very exciting. But I have to describe, just for a moment, the scene, because where I write, I always write outside, and I always write in the morning. And I have an outside, a stand-up desk outside under a canopy, a permanent canopy. And so summer, winter, I always write outside. And the scene is I have this great big huge yard with about a dozen trees, firs and pines over 125 feet tall, and there's six fruit trees and grass, 100 feet of grass that hasn't been cut in 20 years, right? So it, it looks like a meadow. And in the winter, I bundle up and, you know, really warmly, and I cut the fingers out of a glove, you know, so I can stand there and always have this hot cup of black coffee sitting next to me, steaming. And, uh, and so this is beautiful. I mean, it's just beautiful to do that, even in the cold. See, that's very romantic. Here I am, you know, writing this letter. And uh, so I really enjoy it. Uh, for that reason. But there's other reasons. Um, I love the randomness of it. I love the randomness of it. I have a rule. Don't try to write a great letter. Don't. Because if I said, okay, I'm going to have to, I have to write this perfect letter, I'm going to try and write a letter that's gonna, somebody's going to publish or something, then I'd always be caught up in trying to live up to some sort of standard I had. So I just don't do that. I write it. I have never rewritten a single letter. I just, if I make a mistake in spelling or something like that, I just cross it out and, and then go on. So I love the randomness of it. But I also love the, uh, the excitement of sending the letters. So I have at home now um, about 175 letters that I'm getting ready to mail. So I, what I do is I save them up until I have time to go copy them, and then I mail them all at once. And when I put 175 <laughs> letters in the mailbox, right, and I know that during the next two days, 125 people are going to go to their mailbox and open it up, and here's a hand-addressed, you know, calligraphy-written letter. Now, every day when I go to the mailbox, I pray that I'll get a handwritten, hand-addressed letter because it's so special. And they almost never come. But, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm quite serious. I never stop hoping for one. So I have this excitement about 125 people going to their mailbox and finding that the next day. So I love that aspect of it. Um, and then the, I, I guess it, there's just, I've always been one of these people, like I teach in, Seven different distinct topics. Almost every one of the liberal arts I teach at one time and during an average year. And, and so I'm excited about all kinds of ideas. So I'm also excited about the challenge of being able to relate to whatever comes up. What object, what person, what theory, what historical event. And I can find a connection there between that event and my life. And I began to have this confidence that no matter what I looked at, no matter what person I talked to, no matter what idea that I came across, that I could find a connection between that idea or that object and myself and my life in such a way that it would be meaningful. And so that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful experience. And then it's simply fun. 
for a dozen years, I've never said, all right, Charles, get out there and write that letter. You know, this is your discipline. I've never had to do that. I've always wanted to go write those letters every day, and that's the way it's always been. Okay. So that's basically the, how I got started, uh, what my basic process is, um, and some of the reasons that I do it. So I, I brought a, a couple of letters uh, that I selected randomly. By the way, I was really worried about this, selecting the letters. <laughs> well, I've got to go find a really great letter, right? It's got to be one that's going to really be powerful and emotional and, you know, beautiful. And, and I was, <laughs> but I wanted to stay away from that. So I was actually going through, through some other files, and I just came upon, quite accidentally, this file from, of letters from four years ago. And I opened it up, and here were, you know, three or four letters. I said, randomly, let's just use these. So... So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, the first letter is written to a friend in Paris. By the way, I write, there are several people I write in France and um, England and um, Ireland and different places around the world as well as the United States. So this is written to Marie Lies. I have read that the entire universe at its most fundamental level is interweaving patterns of vibration from quirks and electrons to soaring galaxies. Thus, it turns out that Pythagoras was not so far from the truth of things when he suggested that the fundamental nature of all things is mathematical. He understood that the differences between noise and music are mathematical proportions of different vibrations. All of our lives, of course, are one are are partly molded by the sounds our ears pick up and our mind records. If I could hear all the sounds of all my life at once, it would be my personal symphony, the atoms of my physical body reverberating across time in harmony with nature's endless music. For me, a few favorite sounds include June bugs crashing against a screen door on a summer evening, a hundred cicadas scraping their shells at once, Wind pulsing through leaves, a young child's laughter, wind chimes, my love's slow breathing in deepest night, dawn birds calling us to waken, my fountain pen scratching fine paper, hoot owls in a deep forest, wolves howling in mountain recesses, pond ice cracking, dry leaves blowing down a sidewalk, waves slapping a gravel beach, wood fires crackling, a rippling stream, a train whistling a mile away in the middle of the night, wheat fields whispering in, this, in a strong summer wind, frogs croaking, my love sighing in deepest passion, waterfalls, earth shivering thunder, whippoorwills singing out of darkness, a string quartet, Footfalls creaking in the room above me, rainfall on a roof, a farmer's wife calling her husband to dinner across a field, a saddle dropping on a horse's back, opening a window, dawn's rooster crowing, a rust, dawn's rooster crowing, uh, a, a rusty windmill clanking in a summer storm, a hundred voice chorus shaking my heart with perfect pitch and bacon frying in an iron skillet for a farmer's pre-dawn breakfast. The only requirement Earth's music demands of me is that I remain awake to my life. If I stop my ears with worries or foolish fantasies or rushing about on needless errands or gossiping in my head with others, then the Earth's endless music stops and my mind is full of crashing objects, engines, honking horns, and the low hiss of a city which cannot relax, but must be racing about accomplishing a thousand nothings. I cannot really separate the patterns of my mind from the patterns of Earth's music. There are no walls blocking, me out, blocking out the star's song, or the moon's dreaming melodies from the stars and the moon I carry within. One. I want to give you some different kinds of things. So this is a different tone altogether. So this is written to our friends Dan and Beth. 
The man who lives, <laughs> the man who lives in our largest fir tree is about to retire from driving the moon across the sky. According to his own record keeping, he has had this job for about 27 million years. The Department of Planetary Affairs offers a small pension and I have volunteered to allow him to remain rent-free in our fir tree so he should be quite comfortable. Occasionally, when the moon is full, he comes down from his tree home and chats with me about all sorts of moon lore. Did you know, for instance, that the moon was once married? He likes my coffee, and we, pla and we, uh, and we plan to chat more often once his official duties have been handed over. He is trying to convince me to apply for the next opening, which should be coming up in about 25 million years. Why not, I say. And the last one is to um, my, grand my granddaughter, one of my granddaughters. I have 10 granddaughters. And of course, I write them on a fairly regular basis. Um, this, I actually don't. I don't actually use a book or anything like that. I just sit there and I think, you know, whatever pops into my mind, and so this is what popped into my mind. I'm writing Maya. I never, feel, I never cease feeling some level of wonder that plants and animals grow. I know it sounds almost silly, it's so simple, and yet there's part of me that wonders why change? Why not simply remain in the same condition, the same size forever? If that happened, if there were no change, life would have remained as one-celled animal forms. Sometimes I think the universe has a built-in curiosity and wants to discover just how many different life forms it could, it could evolve within itself. We can never know the why of that question, except perhaps to look within ourselves and, re and recognize how we take such great pleasure in creating things, from crayon drawings to masterpieces of painting, from folding paper airplanes to designing space vehicles. Like nature, perhaps, we take innate pleasure in acts of creation. Love, Grandfather Charles. So that's the background, and that's my process. And that's what I love about it. I just want to mention a couple of other, just one or two more things about my, when I'm standing here, because I just, I just can't communicate how beautiful it is when I'm actually doing the writing, right? So off to my left, I have a bird feeder. And there's beautiful birds come every morning while I'm writing, you know, and are, are you know, enjoying breakfast. And then off to my right, I have five uh, wind chimes. And so from this big to, you know, this big, and so tiny gusts of wind, you know, sets them off singing. And so, there's, so I have this sort of chorus that, that, uh, that accompanies me from my writing. It's lovely to come here and to be here with you and share this with you. So um, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, thank you, Charles. That was that was wonderful. I just got my first letter from Charles last week, and it was fantastic. It's a piece on Milton and Paradise Lost, and made me want to read. Um, so before we get into Q and A, we're gonna we're gonna try a little bit of this exercise on our own. So um, people are going to be coming by and passing out postcards and stamps for you all. Here's the deal: you're gonna take a postcard and a stamp, and you're going to write theoretically your address on it and put a stamp on it and give it to somebody else here, ideally somebody that you don't know, and they're going to exchange their postcard with you and you guys are going to write each other a letter. Not right now, but in the future sometime. If you don't want to give out your address, that's fine. You can just make up an address and put it on the card, but don't <laughs> tell the other person that. <laughs> it would be great if you felt comfortable putting your real address on there. but. I understand if you don't. So um, people are going to be, they're working on this, coming down with postcards. Um, if you need a pen to write your address on there, um, probably the person who's exchanging a postcard with you could loan you theirs. And um, we'll take just about five minutes to do this, and then we'll uh, get into Q&A. All right, let's uh, wrap it up, and we'll do some 
uh, if, see if anybody has any questions for Charles here. Thanks. By the way, I brought my ink with me. This is what I dip in. I, it's great. It's very fine. Fine ink. All right. Yes. I was quick. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, <laughs> I have one correspondent, and she's a wonderful writer. And so she writes me with regularity. And, um, and so that's a wonderful thing. So I can look forward to once a month, maybe twice a month, getting a letter from her, so that's beautiful. For the rest of it, I get Christmas cards from 100 people, right? <laughs> Who say, oh, please don't stop writing your emails. <clears throat> I mean, not writing your letters. <clears throat> and that's all I need. That's all I need. Um, last year, I sent, uh, when I, I have email addresses to about 50 of these people, and I sent them an email, um, and then I said, and I sent a self-addressed envelope to another 40 or 50 people. I said, look, if you don't really want to get these letters, just email me back, let me know. I, here's an address letter, send it back, because I don't want to send you a letter if you really don't want it. And I got a couple of people who did write back and say, you know, I'm really just too busy, I'm moving or whatever, and I, I can't do it. But then I got, you know, scores of people who said, oh, no, no, just please keep writing. So, no, actually, I never think about it. It's so much fun writing, right? That is the, so in other words, I get the pleasure is all complete when I finish the letter and send it off. Okay. Uh, yeah, right, right. You know, see, oh, guess, go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Well, the way I, I guess the way I would answer it is that uh, one of the things I love about this is that this person who gets this letter gets something totally unique, totally unique. It's written to them. It's about a topic they maybe never thought of before, and it's from me, and I'm never going to write that letter to anybody else. And I think the feeling that you have when you get a letter like that is wonderful. So I don't write personal things on email. It doesn't feel to me like a place where I can be, you know, that open and personal. So I think maybe we've, I, I, I'm not sure if we've lost something, but I, I think we've, that individuality I think is hard to duplicate, even if you have special little things around your email thing that are like yours. And, and, I think, and I think that, and I do think that's important. I do think that's important, and I think that is something we've lost. So, got anything else? Yes. How do I fill it? Oh, this is so cool. Years and years ago, I just sat down and wrote 150 things I like to write about. And then I went through the great, you know, the 101 ideas of the great books of the Western world. So I took one of those each. Um, uh, and then I just went through my life and wrote down, you know, I don't know, 200 different things that happened to me, you know, and some of them I've never written about yet. Uh, so I just, I, and I do a mind map, by the way, for each one of those ideas. Uh, so, and then, yeah, so that's, that's how I do it. Yeah. Well, I have my own children. I have seven of my own children. And so they get my letters and they occasionally write me back. And so, and they are pretty literate and they do enjoy writing. So I, I've kind of passed that on to them. So they, they enjoy that. I teach a whole, I've, I, over the years I've taught like, you know, several thousand people. And so I talk about this in class when I'm introducing myself. And this is one of the things that I do. And so frequently people ask me questions about it. And I pass, in my classes, I pass the enthusiasm about it on. 
And so inevitably after class, there's two or three people who come forwards and say, oh, would you put me on the list? So that's my way of sort of heart, uh, what, planting seeds. Sure. Yes. And then, and then you, Cole. I'm sorry. Go ahead. How do you get on my list? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really simple. I guess you, you um, find me sitting at Cafe Umbria and writing a letter, and you come out and say, what are you doing? And that's one way. Um, I, I really don't have an answer to that. It's just kind because of, it's always just happened kind of spontaneously. You know, people just came up and said, hey, you know, would you, could you? And so that's, that's the way I do it. Oh, I'm sorry, Cole, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I do. I mean, yeah, I, I poke fun sometimes at the ideas I come up with, and occasionally, it's about three times it's happened in the last, you know, thousand letters, where I struggle and struggle to come up with something to relate to it, you know? Um, there was like, like a scientific idea, a theory, or something like this, and there was all that was on the page were these formulas and scientific <laughs> ideas, and so I would really have to struggle in that sense to come up with something, and then, so then I come up with something loopy because I can't think of anything to say, you know. This formula is really brilliant. Have I ever talked to you about this formula? <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> it's expensive. You know what? I don't even add it up, but I know it's expensive. Stamps, envelopes, and real, I have 36 calligraphy pens. And so what I do is I have them all in a box, and I reach in the box. I'm, it's still random, I, and I don't look. And I pick one of the pens out, and that's the one I'm going to use. And then when I'm done, I put it in another box. And then when that box is filled up, then I put them back in this box. So it, there's that. So there's, yes, it's expensive. Yes. I avoid it. Um, I find myself getting on a high horse every now and then. You know, I have my prejudices. <laughs> and, so, and so they every now and then I see them coming out, you know, about this or that, you know, and I try and tone it down. But, I, but I, no, no, I don't do that. However, uh, I've been teaching history for a very long time, and so I frequently reference history. And then, I refer and then I talk about contemporary history and how we still haven't worked this out. That's kind of the way, that's the way I, I, so I put it in like a broader historical context usually when I talk about it. Yeah. I'll, I'll go in the way in the back there and then you. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. If I'm really angry about something, you know, if I'm really angry about something or, or um, just deeply emotional, something touches me. I mean, you can't help but see, that's the interesting thing about a pen. Uh, it, it, it carries, it, you push differently with a pen when you have these different feelings and you can see it on the page and, uh, you know, you can almost see the passion and, or, or the disappointment or whatever it is in the writing. But, I mean, I, mean, I can't help that, right? I, I know that happens. Yeah. I don't know, you know, I, I, I couldn't say exactly how it gets expressed, but it does, yes. Well, I, buy my, I generally buy my paper from, um, from the basement of uh, uh, University of Washington Bookstore. And so down there they have this art paper, really beautiful. Uh, what, what, is, what is the kind of paper that they wrote the Declaration of Independence on? Parchment. So for years and years, I wrote on parchment only. Uh, but now I mix it up. So it's like, like parchment, but it, you know, I have one eye, so now I have like four different colors sometimes. And I, you know, sometimes it's gray, pink, you know, I mean, I have, yeah.
But I just love, I just love the paper, the feel of the paper. Yes. Oh, no, no. For instance, uh, <clears throat> in these six files, what I've done is I've gone through them like three times now. So what I have done, I've been wondering, is this going to go on forever? <clears throat> so as I have gotten to the third time, I make a big uh, marker circle around it. So, and so to remind myself that this is the third time. And when I've written all of them, and I've written more than half of them now, three times through, I'm thinking I'm going to try something different, but I don't know yet what that is. I still have about 500 to go before I need to worry about that. But I know I don't mark them up. Oh, no, no, no. Because, what, because the thing is, you see, I, I, I write a totally different letter. They're never the same letter. Uh, you know, I, it, that's where I begin, and then, you know, it goes different places. Yes, yeah. Cole was my student, and Luz is his wife, and she's a part of this process and helped, you know, put it together, and that's how. Oh, no. This is the first time ever. <laughs> and, oh, no, this is so, no, 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 no. This, this is just totally silly, right? But, but if you actually sent me letters... And, I, and my wife went to the mailbox, and I have letters from, you know, 25 women. <laughs> it may limit my public <laughs> talk thing again. By the way, I, I, I would just want to mention that because I write to, you know, uh, 40 or 50 women. And so what I do is it's just the files are just totally open. They're just totally open. She can go look at anything she wants. I share letters with her. So you've got to get that out of the way. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I write to my wife. Yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, that's sort of how we got started. We met at a Gary Snyder poetry reading up in Port Townsend. And we just happened to meet. I mean, we'd never seen each other before. And we had coffee with another group of people. And I wrote her a letter, right, saying, you know, God, that was fun. Couldn't we continue our conversation? She still has that, you know, that card that I sent. Yeah, it was great. Yes. You know what? I don't really want to. Um, I, they're not that great. <laughs> I really, I mean, it, it's not like I'm saying something brand new or, you know, it's really not. I mean, they're nice letters. And, but sometimes, like when I was, I was going through last night, I was thought I would look at the current letters I'm writing. Maybe I could find something really hot, you know, to bring. Nothing really stood out. <laughs> so, but I am, um, for my children, I'm thinking of putting, you know, going through and maybe finding 100 or 150 or something and making a book to give to my children. Uh, so when I'm gone, I'll, they'll have that. Because I write my children as well. But they only get like one out of every 100 or something. So, so. Yes. Do I write straight lines? Oh, yes, I do. But let me, let me beca just because my calligraphy writing is sometimes hard to read anyway, so I, I need to do that. But let me tell you one of the most, one thing I didn't, I forgot to bring today, I was going to put it on the screen, is I take great liberty in addressing the letters. Often the person's name I write backwards and upside down. Um, to begin with, when I, my first like thousand letters, um, I wrote, there was original art on the outside of the envelope. There were always three mountains, three blackbirds, a sunset. Uh, yeah, and the, and the sunset was like three different colors. So I take an envelope, I put the first color on the bottom, 50. And I take the, go through the envelopes again, second color. You know, it was like this production, right? And then on the inside, when I first wrote it, I did the same thing on the bottom left-hand corner of the inside. I have original art on the inside and the outside, it was just like took forever to do it, you know. But they're really beautiful. And my, my the, 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 the names, I mean, I always do something screwy with the names. The only thing I have to do is make sure that the address is clear. The address is clear. 
Yes, one more. When I'm writing? Oh, I see. <sighs> Let me think. <laughs> I can't think of anything offhand. <laughs> Yeah, I have one correspondent. Oh, I see. Yes, I've had one or two, one or two, which is it's of a dear friend of mine, and I guess I just overdid it. It's I I tried it twice, and it came back, <laughs> both times. Uh, but for the rest, it has. And and when I when I send letters to France or 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 Europe or something, I'm a, I never mess with the, the names. It always. I'm always very, very clear about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think about that. And what I, uh, what, uh, what I do as a writer is uh, I emphasize words by putting little parentheses around them for emphasis. I mean, that's one thing that I do. Um, and people do give me feedback sometimes. I said, I have no idea what this word is, you know. <laughs> but then they say, well, but in the context, I kind of get it. They kind of have to work with the context. But you know, in a way, I don't even care about that. They just, they can struggle. <laughs> they can struggle. Well, I think that's it. Thank you again for your time. Thank you.